thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, could you share your thoughts on Predator in my phone? I was very impressed by the very good way you have planned for this initiative and how you have managed to certainly to document a very present risk uh, and to do it in a very uh, respectful manner, not frightening manner, but at the same time with a frightening issue, uh, allowing people to realize that risks may be very close and they may come from a neighbor or someone who lives next door or goes to um, a job close to the school of your kids and at the same time to show the power of technology to identify predators and at the same time to allow for an investigation to be supported by strong evidence uh, that can uh, certainly uh, lead to uh, the punishment of those who may be responsible for seducing children but thirdly by the great opportunity that you have utilized to mobilize policymakers and members of parliament to take action to strengthen the national legislation to address cases such as this, which people were using uh, to take advantage of children. So these three elements, I think, are incredibly powerful, and I'm sure that it is generating a lot of awareness within uh, the society in Malaysia, and at the same time, widening the number of MPs that will be supporting the process of reformulation of the national legislation. So congratulations. Thank you. What are the biggest challenges you see in Malaysia concerning the rights of children? Well, you know, it, I, I work particularly on violence-related topics, so obviously I'm looking into those uh, situations. There are risks that are arising from the legislation, as in the case of grooming, that is not covering all children and protecting all children. There are pieces in the legislation that uh, we would like to see strengthen, further strengthen, for instance, to prevent and to prohibit any form of violence against children, including the use of corporal punishment in the home, in the school, and then Unfortunately, it is still legitimized in the country, so obviously we need to, to make a big effort in that regard. Secondly, like in many other countries, we need to raise awareness about the risk of violence and the negative impact of violence on the life of children, on their education ability, you know, the performance at school will suffer, but also in their physical and mental health, their ability to relate and to others and trust others and the ability of solving conflicts without using violent means. And, and, and for that to happen, of course, we need in Malaysia to invest more in information, sensitization, uh, at targeting children, but targeting also the parents, the teachers, and ensuring that all professionals are well trained to prevent to report cases of violence and to help investigate. And one thing I believe could be done in, in Malaysia, you know, that has been done in other countries around the world, is to create opportunities for the services that protect children to work together so that the children who are victims do not have to tell their story over and over again and be re-victimized by the system. What are the roles of religious leader, leaders when it comes to child protection? People respect the voice of religious leaders and very often they are able to enter in the way the discussions take place at home uh, or in the school that no law can achieve. And therefore, when we go to a Friday prayer, when we go to a Catholic church on Sunday or whatever other religion, the fact that there is attention given to the risk of violence, attention given to online abuse, and when parents and uh, other professionals uh, who work with children are provided with advice, you know, we should all join efforts to raise awareness, not to allow uh, any form of violence to happen and we should support the victims rather than blame and bring shame on them. All of that will have a long uh, opportunity for change in the, in the mindset of people. So we, we work closely with religious leaders and here in Malaysia we know that religion is taken very seriously so obviously we would like to see an even stronger role by religious leaders joining hands with all of us in this process. Many activists and politicians from both sides of the divide are determined to end child marriage here in Malaysia where over 9,000 child marriages have been recorded in the last five years. So what is the first step to doing so? 
I think the first thing we need to do is raise awareness about the negative impact and the opportunities of preventing child marriage by investing in education for all, particularly for girls, until 18 years of age. Countries that have done so have seen a visible reduction in child marriage, but also in maternal mortality rates, mm -hmm. child mortality rates, and stronger results in education. But then we also need to change the law. Uh, as we know, in Malaysia, as in other countries around the world, it is still possible to get married before the age of 18. And we also see that uh, we still have in Malaysia, as in other countries, situations where girls are raped and then are allowed to get married to the rapist, which in a way sends a very wrong message that rape has a positive solution or outcome, but we know that that girl will be at a higher risk of abuse later in life. Therefore, we would like to see legislation helping to prevent these situations on all girls and all, all children in Malaysia to be protected from the risks associated with uh, child marriage. Uh, at least until 18, and after 18 they are better informed and can take a decision on their own. Do you think that Malaysia is on the right track to unending child sexual crimes? Well, I, I think the awareness that has been raised uh, also as a result of a very serious case that has taken place here in Malaysia a year or so ago, the fact that there is now a draft bill being discussed is certainly a very encouraging step. Now, what we need to make sure is that the legislation is a model a model for Malaysia and a model for other countries, defining grooming in the most uh, encompassing manner, right? Uh, addressing all children below the age of 18, um, but at the same time that we start raising awareness about what the law will contain. How can people use the law to protect potential child victims? What are the services that are going to be provided if there is something against the law that will be practiced? Because very often we feel that only after the law is adopted we will start planning about how we are going to ensure implementation. And then we spend too much time and people get frustrated and they miss the opportunity of believing on how the law can change reality, right? So I think because there is such a, an important mobilization in Malaysia, it would be very useful that we we would use this momentum to start planning about how can we start implementing that law once it is adopted. Just one final question, Martha. Um, you've been working on child protection issues for over 30 years. What keeps you going? Uh -huh. uh, well, many things, but I think the most important thing is the belief and the hope that the world can really be different for all children. There are many children who have very happy lives but unfortunately there are millions that are not so fortunate and for them uh, the world is made of fear and uh, insecurity and it is for these children that we need to continue to struggle uh, together joining hands with so many actors religious leaders young people politicians uh, professional associations and that belief I think will keep us moving, celebrating things that we achieve, but at the same time being determined to overcome the challenges that persist. And I hope that we will achieve many results. And perhaps in a lifetime, we can celebrate a world without violence. And that will be the best day of my life, I think. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank for you so time. much. Thank you.